So first of all, welcome. And uh, it's just, just a happy thing to see you all. I wish we could all be in per person, but in fact, some of you couldn't come anyhow if we were in person on a, the best of circumstances. So even better that we've got a good representation of people from all over the place. Um, so as, as many of you know, uh, the International Rehab is this organization uh, that's been around for a long time. And a lot of people that are your friends around the world have been members and supporters. And uh, some of them fairly senior people in our field. Um, our work is first of all, to shine a light on what's needed. That sounds like research. It sounds like advocacy stuff. And then to jump in and help fix it. That's, that's kind of what we do as a group, okay? The way that we work is to be subservient to others and to collaborate. We are not a big, strong, powerful arm wrestling organization. We're a bunch of friends who want to try to help people out. And a lot of ways that we help are to help other organizations. So for instance, the ISPRM Disaster Rehab Committee started in our group, and we realized that the WHO and the ISPRM needed to be leaders, not us. So we handed that off and that committee is a bunch of us and, and now others, because it's gone beyond anything we could do. And there are organizations like yours, whether it's uh, an American university or a hospital in Ethiopia, um, that we come in and say, hey, how can we help you to lead your community? How can outsiders help? And how can you as insiders use your power as, as members and friends of the IRF? How does this organization help you, right? Um, we are really subservient to you. And it's a funny thing for you to think about. Um, this organization is you, it's us. And over the years, everything we've done has been driven by individuals saying, hey, I think we need this and then we do it, okay? If you can do it on your own, do it. If there's an international organization with a track record and a bunch of other smart people running around that can help you, great. In various areas, in various countries, People have wanted the credibility of the organization. Uh, our Bangladesh and Pakistan and Indian friends remember the Ministry of Health cutting a ribbon for a new rehab center in, um, uh, in uh, Dakar, Bangladesh when we were there. And it's because we had an international group, right? Um, I think that you get strength uh, from all of us working together. You are not alone. When I look at the countries you're from and the areas of interest you have, you're it, you're the leader. Uh, but at the same time, you are not alone because there are friends around the world fighting the same battles and sometimes winning. So a lot of times it's about advice, people calling each other and knowing that we're all working on this together. And, you know, where somebody's had success in Africa, somebody in uh, uh, the, the Caribbean can, can follow up on that, for instance. Um, and collaboration. Uh, you know, we dream of these multi-center grants. We dream of, well, our, our other programs we have where we, we find that together we're stronger, right? And in various places, because we're registered in the United States as a not-for-profit corporation, thanks to my friend Devendra, who's around the corner here someplace, there he is, um, um, you know, we can, we can do fundraising and have it be tax exempt, or we can apply for grants uh, in the United States uh, uh, and other countries because of that status. Uh, and, and we can knock on doors and ask for money, right? So we're here to help you in any ways that you think we can. Why have we called you together? Um, ah, because there's really good coffee in other countries and I want some. Um, well, because Mita and Devendra Peer know your world and they believe in you, right? Mita, my friend here, our vice president and Devendra, our treasurer, live in the US, run rehab programs in the US and they grew up in India and they run programs in India. They know both worlds and they would be ones that would tell you that what you're doing is very important. Uh, because Tom, at the far end, he wants to visit you all, and he doesn't want his wheelchair chair stuck in the mud, so he needs to know people. <laughs> Tom's our director of communications, and he is a very powerful voice as both a professional journalist and a guy in a wheelchair and a person who knows our field uh, for all of us. Um, because Hannah, on the far end there, no, nope, right next to me, Hannah, <laughs> uh, needs you all to become teachers, right? Hannah is our fellowship director. And you'll see that, that our training program is really pretty sophisticated, meaningful, accepted in a number of countries. And, and Hannah needs your help, okay? And because Emmy, on the far end, it's true, 
need you to collaborate across the disciplines and across the country continents. Uh, Emmy's our academic director, right? So when you think about research, when you think about how we teach, right? Uh, how we work with allied health professionals. Emmy is a doctorate in nursing with a rehab expertise. So she comes at this as a professor and in the, medic, in the medical school who's a nurse and, and knows rehab like none of us. It's amazing. That's why we're here. Also, because I'm going to retire someday. I, I have this thought that by the year 2060, I'm going to be very moldy. And that doesn't make me an effective leader. The mission of building rehab will not be done by that time. This is an ongoing mission, right? Our mission is weak and fragile. We're all underdogs. We're all people that are not powerful in our world. So we have to pull together to be strong, okay? Our teams are rare in low resource countries, right? Really effective rehab programs are really rare. Academic global rehab, you Americans and people in industrialized countries, you know, the idea of being the professor of global rehab at the university of someplace, it doesn't exist. At least in the United States and our European friends are maybe a half a step ahead. So the academic careers of people in prosthetics or orthotics or spasticity, those careers are far launched. And yet where's the professor at an American university who is the one you go to because they know the epidemiology and methods, there isn't one, okay? And I'm looking around at my old friends and some new friends and, and man, do we have powerful brains here, okay? When, when you look around the young people, you'll just start to get to know each other. But this is a powerful group of young inspired leaders from around the world. Uh, we got the goods, we got people that can do this. So today we need to bring it together, build a couple competencies and set you loose. This would be maybe better if it was a, a three week long course, we can't do that. So stay with us friends. Our goals are for you to get to know each other a little bit, to actually work together a little bit, for you to get some sense some snapshot, some validity in understanding global rehab issues, for you to gain a few skills that may advance your own goals. And in the end, we think we're gonna write a white paper, maybe a couple on the status of academic global rehab, of what's actually going on and uh, uh, make sure you're all registered so we can include you as acknowledged on this, on this white paper we put together. Um, and, and actually to kind of launch you off into work on your own goals in your own country and your own hospitals. The agenda is this. Um, we're all getting warmed up right now. Uh, pardon me, I have to get my clock going here so I can tell where we are. Thank you. Um, uh, we're going to have a couple questions. You know, why aren't there more trainees in your part of the world, led by a few of you who I hope are all logged in? Uh, why, what does it take to get US PMNR programs to engage? Then a whole section on sustainability, a little break some discussion about the Africa Fellowship, which is a really successful model, and then on to tricks for communication and, and ways you'll work in communication. And by 12 o'clock noon in the United States, Eastern time, uh, you'll all be off and either off to bed or off to work, whatever happens on a Saturday for you. So um, the first session, um, if you're in there, Farouk, Lorraine, Francois, Raju, Benedict, you can unmute. Um, whoever's in there, you'll just have to let us know and, and go one at a time. It's kind of rapid fire. It's going to take some discipline. And what I'd like you to do is introduce yourself and give us a couple comments on the challenges or what you're thinking about why there aren't more trainees in your part of the world. Um, Farouk, I know you're in there. Are you unmuted? Can you join us? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Hello, everyone. I'm Farouk from Pakistan. Yeah. So should I go first? Yes, please. And set the tone. Okay, let me set my timer because three minutes means 180 seconds. Just give me a second. Yeah. That's my man. Okay, that's it. okay. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me as a young like uh, member. So I really feel young at heart right now and in physique as well. So my name is Farooq. Uh, I started my training back in January 2005, and suddenly after nine months or probably eight months, the October 2005 earthquake came in. We were not prepared well, and that was the time when the world, I mean the world, uh, the world as in global world and the Pakistani uh, community realized the value of PM&R, specifically in context of spinal cord injuries and amputee rehabilitation. We did not have any real good expertise over there. 
at that time i was resident i started like connecting with people and somehow i got connected to a person called professor andrew hague back in some michigan state university like that uh, it's like 16 years old affiliation which still continues and so far i identify myself as primarily as a rehabilitation medicine physician with a special background expertise in pain medicine but in addition i also identify myself as a teacher which means whatever i have learned and gathered over the last 15 years i'm pretty uh, enthusiastic to share with my colleagues for example so far i have done 96 face to face workshop on medical writing communication skills capacity management stroke rehab in five countries of the world and i also identify myself as mentor and i formally and informally do mentoring uh, primarily for people based inside pakistan but also for a couple of colleagues based outside pakistan so that was all about me now coming to the question that why don't we have don't why don't we have a good number of residents in pmr and a robust strong pmr training program in pakistan one disclaimer i am just an individual this is my own thinking and my own expertise so other might uh, disagree or maybe comment or and i'm okay with that the most important thing that uh, the reason is number one a lack of exposure to pmr as an undergraduate student so we don't have pmr as a part of undergraduate medical curriculum the eyes cannot see what the mind doesn't know so our medical students absolutely have no idea what pmr is all about they get rotations in neurology cardiology in gynecology just name it but they don't get rotations in pmr because pmr is only available in major cities that's the first thing number 2 there are very few training programs in pakistan it's a country of 226 million people we still have only 90 pmr physicians out of which 15 are practicing outside pakistan so honestly we are like uh, it's like uh, around 10 to 20 million people per uh, uh, physician in pmr in pakistan so we have only one training program known as uh, the fellowship program we don't have any md program or a masters program uh the other thing that we have to blame our own self the pmr community in pakistan so our society pakistan society of physical medicine rehabilitation as of today does not have a formal outreach program where they reach out to people and make them realize the value of joining pmr as a career choice then we have to sort of like uh, i have to admit it with a very heavy heart we don't have many inspirational figures in pakistan and pmr as for example we have really good inspirational figure in cardiology cardiac surgery maybe neurology neurosurgery people who once they stand in front of a podium people would actually listen to them in awe we don't have those kind of inspirational figures in pakistan so if you don't inspire people you don't expect them to come and join you as a team and the last is actually a lack of opportunity and a clear road map which means when people come to me they say okay i'm going to join pmr can you tell me where i'm going to be in the next 5 year 10 year 15 years and i'm sorry unfortunately most of us don't have a clear answer to that question i have already overshot my 3 minutes so these are my 2 cents or let's say my 6 cents on this topic thank you very much <laughs> many lakh cents um um learny you just jumped in i hope you're not confused but can you give us your introduction and a couple of ideas hi sure good morning everyone uh my name is learny luisa i am currently a pgy3 so third year resident in physiatry at mount sinai hospital in new york through icon school of medicine I am originally from Montreal, Canada, but my family's from Haiti. I've always had an interest in rehab medicine goes back to about 2010 after the earthquake in Haiti and I've been involved and consistently involved in projects uh in Haiti due to that. I went to med school actually in the Caribbean. I went to Ross University which was in Dominica but now in Barbados. So I did my first 2 years of training in the Caribbean and then moved to the US. Through that experience and also volunteering that really is what you know sparked my interest in the caribbean and also in the field of physiatry um so why physiatry in the caribbean is the question uh it's an area that's very untapped there aren't really any um there's maybe a handful of physiatrists that are uh working in the caribbean um and there are multiple islands that have been affected by different type of natural disasters from hurricanes to volcano eruptions to even earthquakes uh to name a few and there's a need for physiatrists in terms of the caribbean in itself there is an organization called caricom which is the caribbean community and it basically is a grouping of 26 countries throughout the caribbean so that's really to give you an idea of how many islands there are or countries within the caribbean and there's over about 60 million uh the population is from about 60 million so think about the needs within uh that area geographic area in terms of uh medical schools in itself there are multiple medical schools over about 70 medical schools within the caribbean 
But within that, there are about uh, four or five that are recognized in the U.S. where you can train there and then return to the U.S. Some of them are St. George's University, AUA that's in Antigua. There's also the Central University of the Caribbean and also Ross University. Now, the question of why is there no physiatry in the Caribbean? Uh, part of it is like... Um, um, as mentioned in the previous presentation by Farouk, sorry, um, it's not a part of the medical school curriculum. Even for me, that's trained kind of in a U.S.-based curriculum, curriculum in the, the Caribbean, that there was no mention of physiatry at all. There's a focus, obviously, on the anatomy and the physiology, but not really a focus on anything rehab-related or what we train in as far as uh, physiatrists, which sometimes is even an issue in the U.S. as well. Um, and that in itself is a trickling effect in terms of how many actually training physiatrists there are in these uh, Caribbean islands and what kind of what kind of uh, medical, you know, basically training you get, but also the patients that actually have those needs, what are they actually getting? So there's a lack of those physicians there. Um, like I mentioned, there's only a handful of physiatrists that I know of that are in the U.S. that are in uh, the Caribbean that have trained in the U.S. Some of them are in Jamaica and also in Barbados, but that's about it. Uh, the other thing that I would like to mention in terms of the lack of physiatrists in the Caribbean is understanding the importance of some of the allied health professionals that are in the Caribbean. So nurses, physical therapists, and occupa occupational therapists, they play a huge role in basically the care of these patients. As an example, in Haiti, the, um, the PTs and OTs, those are the rehab champions that, you know, they have these clinics, they do a lot of sensitivity training and also reach out in terms of into their community and do a lot of advocacy work. So in those areas, it's important for us to not only tap into, you know, how, what we can do as physicians, but also um, working alongside with these allied health professionals. I'm excited to be here and see what kind of work we can do in the Caribbean. Thank you so much. Fantastic. By the way, a shake out to Venetia, my PT friend, who's part of our leadership team. Good, glad you're here. Francois, it's great to see South Africa. How are you? <laughs> Hi, guys. Well, no, I'm very well, thank you, except I'm cold. I don't know. You all guys seem to be in nice warmer climes than I am. But in any case, be that as it may, thank you very much for the opportunity and thanks for the invite. Um, well, yeah, my name is Francois Teron. I'm, I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training. I, um, I trained, uh, I, and this, is, this is my, maybe where I get a bit sketchy. I'm not young anymore. <laughs> I've, um, <laughs> I um, started my career as a, as a military officer in the 1990s in, in South Africa. I did my training as an orthopedic surgeon and then ended up in a place called Stoke Mandeville in the UK, where I did a, a sort of fellowship in spinal cord injuries. Um, I came back to South Africa in the start of uh, to the 2000s and have been working as a, a, a spinal surgeon, but I have a huge passion and interest in, in rehab as a, as a career um, and as a, as a discipline. I um, started a, a unit and I quickly realized that rehab is more than spinal cord injuries. There, there's a lot of other stuff involved as well. And we started off with two beds in my hospital and this has eventually through um, through commitment grown to a, a 60 bed unit that does mainly spinal cord injuries and neurological rehab in my hospital. So that's a bit of my background. Um, over the years, I've come to realize that um, orthopedic surgery is, is one thing and I, I'm still very much involved in that. But what do I do with my patients after I've installed and done their surgery and I've, I've put in $20,000 worth of instrumentation into their spine and then I can't get a $500 wheelchair for them or whatever the cost might be. Um, so, so I think that's a sort of conundrum that I think we all face. Now, back to the South African situation, we have no... Um, uh, training in PMMR. Um, if you ask my colleagues, in, uh, unfortunately, in the country, other doctors and other surgeons, um, you talk to them about rehab, the first thing that they say is, well, it's either drug rehab or alcohol rehab, or it goes down to, to it's, um, it's something that the physios and the OT department does on the other, in the basement of the hospital, isn't it? Or maybe we should go to 
the psychologist. So in South Africa, unfortunately, um, as with Farouk and Lorraine's um, previous comments, there's no awareness. So there's no undergraduate um, sort of training. There's no uh, recognized discipline. So in our regulatory environment, you can't register as a physiatrist in South Africa because that's not part of what um, the Health Professionals Council and our, our regulatory authorities recognize as a separate discipline. Um, flowing from that, obviously, we have a very much a, a fee-for-service type of service model delivery, so there's no reimbursement for, for physical medicine and rehabilitation for doctors. So, so there's a lot of challenges in South Africa to address this. Um, I've been fortunate enough that um, I, I've, through all my shouting over the years, managed to get a, a very fledgling society going in South Africa. So we've started with a small group. We're about uh, 30 physicians in South Africa that now have formed a physical medicine and rehabilitation society. And hopefully we can, we, we plan to later on in, and I think that's a topic that Andy will discuss in due course is the training and the academic skills, maybe partner with a lot of you guys on the call here today and maybe get some training of the, the, the doctors here in South Africa going. So I'm, I'm really thankful for the opportunity. I'm, I'm blessed to be viewed as young, so so that's that's very nice, Andy. Thanks, and um, I hope we can get get um, something established before I become moldy as well, like Andy. <laughs> <laughs> this is our job, my friend. Thanks so much. I don't see Raju there. Uh, um, oh, Raju showed up. I see he came up. Raju, how are you? Yeah. Can you tell us I, who you are and and talk about the, the the why we don't have more trainees in in Nepal? How are you? It's good to see you. <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Dr. Raj Dakar. Uh, I'm working as a medical director at Spinal Injury Rehabilitation Center, that is 51 bedded rehab hospital. So basically, uh, in overall, in Nepal, rehabilitation has been not still. We'll, we'll lose people a little bit. This is my timeout. We don't hear Raju. <laughs> The, as a healthcare facility, that is, you know, rehabilitation has been tested. Welcome to low rehab research and rehab teaching. Uh, dear. Uh, 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 depend on the donors and and the non-governmental agencies and organizations. We went to different universities to start residency training program, but because of uh, you know, we need at least three faculty to start the PMNR residency program. That's why I couldn't do that. But a few of my junior colleagues, they have already been in Bangladesh and they are in India in Ames. And, and hopefully they will come back in Nepal and then we can start PMNR residency training. And one good thing is like, you know, I've been more involved in the, the government ministry of health and population for, uh, for different guidelines and policies uh, regarding the rehabilitations. And I have included the, 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 the need and importance and the role of female in, uh, in, in, in the rehabilitation sectors. And, and also I've been you know, talking with the uh, Ministry of Health and Population to have a female department in, in the hospitals, I mean, government hospital. And, 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 and we don't have even single female department in any hospital in Nepal, uh, but uh, we have a um, few physiotherapists and very, very uh, um, low, very, very, very few occupational therapies. So, so the the we, why we don't have training is, uh, you know, we don't have faculties. That is the main issue. So hopefully we can do this within within a few years with Sir ISPRM or the other team. Uh, so thank you so much for, you know. Uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, giving me this opportunity to explore tell about the Nepal. Yeah. Raju, you do amazing work. And over to more amazing stuff. Benedict in Ghana, can you tell us uh, about this issue? Hello, everyone. And thank you, Prof. Haig and the IRF, IRF team for this opportunity to speak to a global audience. Um, I am a family physician. 
and and I am currently pursuing a fellowship uh, program in sports exercise and rehabilitation medicine <coughs> with the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons, and that is the main college for training specialists and and, and fellows in the country. Um, I also um, I'm a head of the leprosy hospital, uh, leprosy general hospital, and double up as the uh, national program manager for leprosy in the country. So I've combined clinical care, um, administrative work, and public health uh, program management in, in my country. Really stumbled into into the world of rehab, I would say that I was posted as a young medical officer to a district hospital. It happened to be a leprosy hospital. And, and um, uh, evidently, I mean, the focus on persons affected by leprosy uh, and disability then, then sort of um, inspired or sort of invoked the interest in, in rehab. I trained in a center that was palliative care focused, uh, but Fortunately, by the time I finished uh, my my membership training, um, I, I got wind of 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 this uh, the possibility of sub specialising in 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 physiatry, and that's why uh, since January first, I, I have started my my fellowship in physiatry. Why do we have so few trainees um, in in this part of the world? In fact, I'm the second person being trained as uh, Physiatrists in Ghana. We've only had one, one other physiatrist trained in our system. Uh, the programs were not the training programs were not there. Just like um, South Africa spoke about, it was only in in, in 2018 that uh, the Ghana College um, adopted a, a curriculum that was developed with the help of of, of the I, IRF and Profec was very instrumental in that. Um, it also means that we don't have trainers. I mean, it means that I only have one person that can actually supervise me that was trained in our system. And, 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 and so uh, there, are, there are very few opportunities for, for hands-on training. Um, you may get exposure to other therapists who, who, who actually fill that space, but uh, we don't have uh, physiatrists trained to actually give, give, give us that kind of training. We also have a problem with awareness. Um, medical doctors are not aware of physiatry uh, as an area they can go into. Uh, they see it largely as another field where you have allied health professionals uh, um, working in there, but they don't see it as an opportunity. Very recently, we have added uh, uh, an introduction to some sports exercise rehab medicine as part of the faculty of family medicine lectures with a foremost university. So I gave those lectures, those kind of um, exposure lectures to the students. And we do that for the final uh, final year students. So hopefully that should pick up interest in, 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 in young doctors to pursue a career in physiatry. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so if you'll all mute and then uh, Lauren, Sharik, Ahmed, Manoj, and Natasha, if you're uh, on deck here. Um, we want to start with the voices of you, and we'll get to some more detailed things as we go. In the United States and in other industrialized countries, there's a real difficulty in getting academic institutions to take on the science of this. And so if each of you would uh, introduce yourself and give a minute or two of, you know, what does it take to get U.S. PM&R programs to be engaged internationally? Lauren, are you up? Sure. Hi. Good morning. I'm Lauren Shapiro. I'm an associate professor at the University of Miami, and I'm also an advisor in our MD MPH program. Though I'm usually a brain injury physiatrist, my international work has been in the care of persons with amputation, primarily in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, the hospital I work at in Miami Jackson Memorial is also the referral center for patients with major trauma and neurologic events for many islands in the Caribbean basin. Um, I think there's tremendous interest among our trainees and our colleagues in global health rehab. 
there's just not a whole lot of like clear opportunities for most people to practice and do research in international settings, particularly for those who don't already have experience in these settings. I think a few residency programs in our field have done really amazing things developing such programs. And I think more of us really just need to work on this. I know in my experience and the experience of other people I know who have been involved in international rehab, it largely results from us having either personal contacts in a country or um, friends who run charity organizations and we just sort of fall into this line of work. And we need to develop ways that people who maybe don't have these contacts who do have that interest to join up with experienced teams so they can get involved in these kind of programs in the future. Thanks, Lauren. Sharika, are you out there? I didn't see you. Oh, there he is. Hey there, yeah, I'm here. Good. Hey everybody, so I am, sorry, I'm in a meeting. Uh, my name's Sharik. I am currently a transitional year resident down in Florida in St. Petersburg. Um, I'll be joining the Zayatry Residency at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Go ahead. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I want to echo a lot of what Dr. Shapiro said. I feel like I've talked to a lot of residents um, around my age and whatnot, and they're, they're really interested in this area, including the ones at my program. Um, but when I, you know, try to tell them what specific things that they can get involved in, um, I'm at a loss um, as far as opportunities. Um, I think that there's a lot of passive interest also, and maybe a, a way to um, make it more action-oriented and more urgent and more buy-in would be to have more opportunities for international um, electives for PMO residents. Um, yeah, that's basically what I got. More on, on what you do later on, Sharik. Thank you so much. Ahmed? Sure. I see him. All right. Can you hear me, Dr. Eric? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you for having me. So um, I think I'll start off just by saying uh, where I'm from. So. Uh, my name is Ahmed Al Said. I am. Uh, my family's initially uh, originally from Cairo, Egypt. Um, I grew up in Toronto, Canada, and I went to medical school here in the U.S. in Arizona. I uh, did my residency in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I'm currently in Seattle, Washington, doing a sports medicine fellowship um, in a, in the physiatry department here at the University of Washington. So, um, my interest in global health goes back to undergrad. I um, did my uh, undergraduate degree in kinesiology and uh, exercise physiology. And so I had a big interest in physical activity and how, um, how sports, access to sports and exercise um, really changes communities. And so I uh, founded the organization called Playmakers Foundation, where we um, really did small projects to promote sports and physical activity in uh, under-resourced communities, mostly in Africa. And um, it, initially this mostly started with providing things like, um, you know, soccer nets, uh, sports equipment, things like that to, uh, to uh, different community centers, schools. And I think from the US standpoint, there's definitely no shortage of people who are interested in global health within the physiatry community. I think um, one of the biggest problems is there's not a, a big understanding of w where we can contribute. So it's, it's very clear, you know, if you go on like Doctors Without Borders website, it's very clear how many opportunities there are for, you know, surgical people or primary care people. Um, there's very uh, concrete projects and things that they can work on, but it's not so clear for, for physiatrists. I think the second thing I would share would be um, a structural, um, you know, formal education in global health isn't really also present in most programs. I, I mean, where I trained in Milwaukee, there was um, an inaugural program the year that I was leaving essentially. So I was one of the first uh, global health scholars in the, in the program, but um, not to my knowledge, I think only two, uh, maybe two other programs in the entire country offer a, a formal global health, you know, a scholar program for residents. Um, so I would say in short, it's a mixture of, uh, an educational thing and a gap in knowledge. Um, and also lastly, probably uh, just, you know, uh, connections with people internationally. So uh, if somebody, you know, has great ideas or would like to do um, any, uh, you know, number of whether it's educational or, uh, or 
infrastructural projects in in any uh, country. A lot of people don't really know people in those countries, so that's why I think it's really important to have kind of these meetings. And I think uh, really excited to get to know people here from uh, from from Africa, my my area of uh, interest. And so, uh, thank you for having us, Dr. Hay. Thanks for jumping in because we've got a bunch of experts. So I'm excited to hear you, Natasha. Where are you, buddy? I hear you someplace. Natasha, I saw. I thought I saw her. Um, we'll give it a couple seconds. I, I thought I saw her log in. Um, I'll give it five more seconds, I but I don't see her either. Um, thanks, everybody. We're going to come around to this. There's a bit of rapid fire, uh, and then um, I, I kind of want to come back to uh, uh, Tom. If that doesn't, I'm admitting you. And if you make noise, we're going to kick you out. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so. Uh, I, I want to kind of, you know, one, one of the, the goals that we had was for us to teach you stuff, to have you go out with a bit of a, of a, of a uh, gift. And, and one of the things that's most important to all of us is about sustainability, right? And, you know, what am I going to do in 15 minutes to make you smart? Nothing, nothing, right? So what I'd like to do is have you just listen in and take notes about things you want to learn about more, uh, about gaps, about good ideas. Uh, as I run through some basic ideas here. Um, by the way, if you want more, there are two other resources that we have. Um, one is a really great recorded conversation between Dr. John Melvin, who's one of the great leaders in the history of our field, and the economist Paul Clyde, who um, uh, uh, talked together with, about, with our African colleagues on sustainability in Africa. And another one uh, that, that I put together with my friend Sinforian, uh, about um, teams and rehab from the microcosm up to government uh, for the, uh, the Cameroon Society. And we have those on the website. Those are worth looking at if you really get into this stuff. But this is just a laundry list and it's not an exciting get a set of slides because it's a laundry list, okay? So you gotta fess up, you gotta confess to what you are. You are superstars. When you walk into the office of a banker or you walk into the office of a minister of economics, you're one of the smart people coming in the office, okay? You have a lot of power, you know? You've got a lot of clinical skills, uh, right? But that's not really why we're meeting today. We're gonna come back to that. Um, you all have leadership skills. You, you, you didn't get into medical school simply because you were smart and passed a bunch of tests. You also were seen as a compassionate person, a leader. That doesn't mean you have to be loud and crazy. It means people will want, you know, the definition of a leader is somebody that other people follow, right? And there are many mechanisms by which you lead and they don't have to be loud and crazy and on the podium. They can be people going, boy, I wish I was like her, right? Or they can be somebody looking at what you wrote and saying, I think I can do that too, right? What you need to think about as you embark on global rehab <clears throat> is what leadership skills do you have? Which ones do you need to improve on? And frankly, where do you need to follow, okay? I used to be king of the planet and I've been demoted a bit. And my real job is to follow a lot of other strong leaders, okay? And so followership is one of the skill sets you have to have. Um, slides, please, there we go. My slides are not cooperating, there we go. So thinking about skills that you need to have, okay? My friend Noel Titchy is one of the world's great leadership experts, uh, maybe a top five or top 10 leadership guru in the world, in the corporate world. And Noel and I worked for years on these things. Uh, one of the things he talks about is a teachable point of view, or sometimes you'll call it the elevator speech. When you talk to somebody, whether it's a group or a person in the elevator, do they get what you're trying to do? Can you consolidate your vision for what you're trying to do into the point where it's teachable and people get what you're about. It's a skill set to really have as you start talking to people. You don't want to confuse them with the details. Can you choose your mentors? All of us have mentors. And uh, Joe Kolar is the Dean for Global Health at Michigan has a whole lecture. Joe, Joe is going to come speak with us about this. And he ended up having a horrible multiple fracture injury and he can't come. But his whole talk is about how young people need to look for mentors, tell them they're mentors, and tell them how they can help. What's interesting about mentors is they want to help. 
us old people, Francois, you're, you're like me, right? You're not quite there yet. Uh, but us old people that are mentoring, it's not because we're forced, okay? It's because we're like, this is really fun. This is really cool. In fact, if you approach somebody for a mentor and they're like, yeah, but I'm busy, finds me next Tuesday, they're, just leave them, okay? But you de- do need to look around and say, so who's the person in obstetrics that can really help me get connected with how university politics works? Who's the rehab doctor in another city who grew up in Africa and can inform me about what's going on? Who's the scientist uh, who can teach me how to excel, right? So you need to actively choose mentors and then you need to help them out and say, hey, I'm really seeing you as a mentor. Can I have coffee with you every couple months? And the ones who like mentoring will be like, I am so happy this young person came up to me and said they like to have coffee, right? So the ones who love you, love you, and you will find good mentors. You need to choose them. Can you choose and mentor a team? And there is so much about teamwork, and there's a lot written about teamwork more in the world of business than in rehabilitation. But, you know, my bad joke about our field is, you know, surgeons use knives, internists use pills, and physiatrists use teams, right? It is, it is the pill that we have, and you have to get good at it. For many of this, us, you come into the field with a set of skills. It's probably what drew you to the field. You say, wow, I can meet with these brilliant therapists and doctors and whatever like that. And you also have mentors who are good teachers. So you sit in a team meeting and you watch your professor run the meeting. You go, this is very well done. But mostly you don't get formal training in how to manage a team. Uh, You come onto a rotation for a month and then you leave. And then when you get to the point where, uh, uh, you know, where my friend Lorraine is <laughs> and, and she's got to manage a dysfunctional occupational therapist and a PT that talks too much and they don't even have a social worker, how do I run a team? So just one little snapshot of this to get your brain going. Uh, grippy, goals, roles, processes, and interpersonal. If you sit after a meeting of your management team and say, what were our goals? Are we all clear about that? Okay. What were each of our roles? And did we use your roles well? Do we understand that not only are you a physiotherapist, but you happen to have a mother who's a banker and maybe you know something about money, right? Uh, what are the processes? Did we decide who's in charge? Did we decide who gets to speak? Did we run over each other? Mm-hmm. What are the processes? And then finally, from an interpersonal standpoint, are we okay? Was this fun? Was this worthwhile? Did somebody feel offended, right? And, and this is just a snapshot of, boy, if you did a grippy on a team sometime, if you took, after your lunchtime team meetings, took another 15 minutes, passed out the coffee and said, hey, are we doing okay with this process? Okay. Hiring and firing people is not the job of a resident and usually not the job of a junior faculty and often not the job of a senior faculty in great big institutions, but you need to understand the process just as a snapshot of the skill sets. So there's a, another thing that my friend Noel Titchy talks about with me, and you're looking at people who are really aligned with your mission or, or not so much, right? You're looking at really effective people, getting it done, closers, we call them in baseball, they close the game, or low effective people. So obviously, if they're highly aligned with your mission and highly effective, bring them ice cream cones, you know, um, hug their children, do whatever you can to keep them with you. They are the winners, okay? Duh, if they don't like what you're all about, they might be competent, but they aren't very effective. They need to go. You just don't need to hang on to dead meat. You, 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 you dead whatever, you need to have them go, right? If they really love what you're at, if they get the way you're approaching the problem, but they're not getting the job done, with a lot of kindness and a lot of insight, look at why, okay? A lot of times you can fix that by aligning things, look at their strengths and weakness, coaching them forward. It helps build them as people. It's a really great thing to do. And yet, if it doesn't happen after best efforts, it's also a place to say, you know, you really, thank you very much, but you're probably worthwhile someplace else. These people are not useless, okay? Uh, Jack Welch, the president of General Electric, used to call hiring people the kindest thing he could ever do, or firing people the kindest thing he could ever do, because if they don't fit us, don't you dare pretend like they aren't worthwhile human beings. They need to find someplace else they fit, okay? So don't keep people that 
just can't get the job done, okay? Here's the funny part. Let's say they're really good, but they're not aligned with your mission. Fire them yesterday. Fire them yesterday. Because somebody who is a role model, looking good, making the money, highly productive, and isn't going where you're going is going to steal the show and corrupt your mission, okay? And it's a hard lesson. I've made that mistake a few times where I've hung on to somebody because they're really good and they sabotage things, even not on purpose, even not on purpose. People are like, that's the way, uh, the way that Fred's doing it. Andy's talking, but the way that Fred's doing it is really good and Fred's really smart, sabotages your mission. So this is a snapshot of management that you need to get good at, okay? Um, Oops, let's see, I got to click on here again. There we go. So just again, the laundry list. Can you map a value chain? First of all, can you look at the political map? Who cares? Why do they care? Why do they care at kind of a, a corporate level? Like what's their job, right? I'm the head physical therapist and I need productivity. Why do they care at a personal level, right? Their little brother has cerebral palsy or they want to be the next president of the hospital and they don't want you to mess up their process, right? So you literally write down an Excel spreadsheet or on paper, who cares? Why do they care? Uh, somebody should mute, please. Um, you know, why do they care before you really move forward? And then the other thing to think about is the chain of value. Every person who's going to do something, every organization that's going to do something is going to do it out of self-interest. Okay, often their self-interest is your self-interest, right? They want the right thing to happen, but you need to respect and understand the differences in their self-interest. So the head of occupational therapy at your American hospital really wants to build rehab in, in uh, Africa, and you do too, and that's a win, but be respectful of the fact that they're really into the hand part, or they're really into building occupational therapy and you want to build uh, rehab uh, medicine. So you need to respect these differences. So very important to kind of pretty formally map out who's who, why they're involved and what the value is for them personally and organizationally, right? Can you actually do this geeky thing that the business, the MBA students do, right? Making a business plan, right? And, and all of you at some point, someplace have been involved in some part of this. But if you sat down and said, I'm going to build a lemonade stand, could you actually go through the formal process of what's our mission? What's the vision, the way we're going to do it? What are our core values? What are the things we're thinking of the way we're going to go about it? We're going to be nice to people. We're going to be grumpy, right? Can you do things like a SWOT analysis? What are our strengths compared to the competition? What are our weaknesses compared to whatever is getting in our way? What are the opportunities when we look forward? What are the threats when we look forward, right? You write this stuff out. And then you get into this really basic stuff and you can have friends do this. There are friends with MBAs who are smarter than us at this, but you need to know this has to happen, right? Who are the people? What's the space? What's the equipment? What's the supplies? What's our marketing strategy? What's our capital, right? And I'm not saying you have to build a formal business plan to take a road trip to Bangladesh because they've got good food there. I would just go. But on the other hand, if you're getting a little bit more mature about a process, you want to start thinking this way. And then it's kind of hard. What's the return on investment for your team? And we're not talking profit necessarily, but if you can't come up with a way that it sustains itself, you better think again, because it's one thing to be a medical tourist for my friends in, in outside the United States, it's one thing to build a lymphedema clinic, but if it's not gonna sustain itself, please think again, okay? Do you know how to raise funds? Especially in the United States, donors and it's called development. It's a really big part of academics. At, at the University of Michigan, I, I chaired a committee. I, I, I didn't do the work but the faculty committee that was involved in getting four billion US dollars of donations to the University of Michigan, okay? In American institutions, there are ways this are just done and every American hospital, even this little, we're in uh, Porter Hospital, which is a 50 bed hospital in rural Vermont in the farms, and there's a director of development. So in the US, do you know who they are? Can they teach you? Can they collaborate? Now they're not the people that give you the name of somebody who's gonna donate money. 
They're the people who help you to figure out how you're going to build. Uh, somebody says, I like what you're doing. How can I help? They're basically saying, I would like to donate money. And then you say, please give us $10,000. They're like, not like that. Can you give us a hundred bucks? Or thank you very much, but I'd like you to help us get other friends to help us. And don't care about them giving you money, right? Care about them getting a consortium. And like, I would be glad to, we'll have a golf outing and raise $10,000, right? Do you know how to do that, right? Can you find people? And then of course, the obvious thing for you folks in academics is, can you write that scientific grant? Can you write a grant to the Ford Foundation? Can you get money from other places, right? So these are some of the skills that are on your checklist that you need to mess with. Action. Number one, get clinically competent. Or residents, <laughs> when you get in a community, the fact that you're the go-to doctor in rehab means so much in terms of your colleagues giving you room, space, trust, and the patient population. So don't cut down on the fact that you just wanna be a really good caring doctor. If you're in academics at all, get world famous on the smallest topic you can think of. If you're thinking about getting world famous on the right thumbnail, just do it on the distal half of the right thumbnail. Don't try to cure all of the planet of AIDS because there's already 50,000 people doing that. And in fact, you'll be a really bad scientist if you do. So both in terms of your real impact in science and in teaching, and in terms of the politics of science and teaching, get really micro, focus in on the left-hand part of the upper part of the thumbnail. You can still do prosthetics and orthotics. You can still do other things, but get a reputation so that you're on the podium. In our global rehab areas, come up with something real specific you wanna do, okay? And that's for you to decide, but get real specific. Um, and, and we'll work on those ideas. I hope today you hear from friends that help focus your thoughts. Get local supporters. We're an international group of friends. We're on your team. But the real energy that's gonna happen for you is when you bring people together for pizza every month and they begin to identify and people think it's fun and the pizza's pretty good and they bring their cousin who happens to have another skill set. Just get a group, local group. Um, I always look at the IRF as something fraudulent because we like made a letterhead and said we were running a residency fellowship and we were a world organization. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So name your group, give them a logo, give yourself a title, give your colleagues a title. You, you, you don't need a license to say that she's the director of research for the University of Southern Pittsburgh Medical School Rehab Program. Give out titles and logos and, and they're all self-fulfilling prophecies. We can help a lot. So if we can help, great, but don't get hung up on that. Um, come on, slides. Uh, build a plan. Raise money. Henry Betts built the Rehab Institute of Chicago, 24 stories tall in downtown Chicago. It was paid for before they built it. And Henry would tell, he was my boss, my mentor, one of them. Uh, and he said, it's just as hard to raise $100 as it is to raise a million dollars. Another problem I see for young leaders is you're too damn humble, okay? Your mission is big and huge and you're leading and you're young and you've got energy and don't go for oh, the bake sale where we'll sell cookies. Don't do that. You are big mission and just, you know, stop taking your held apparel doll, start hallucinating and get grandiose and be big, okay? Network, share, present, make yourself visible. If you're doing it, don't hide it under a bushel basket. Let people know you're doing it because more people will be attracted to what you're doing, okay? It's hard because most of us, most of you, I know you well as just um, humble, hardworking, caring about what's going on people. Um, get over it. Your mission is bigger than you and you should be big. Attitudes, that's where I'm at here. Swallow your pride and beg, okay? Uh, when I ran the spine program at Michigan, I did not try to get donors, okay? When I got, cause we, we, were, we were making money. We didn't need that, yeah. When I was running Global Rehab, I started saying, we, you know, if I can only get another thousand dollars, I can get Benedict over here to the States, right? Talk to the boss, okay? If your mission is important, your leader is willing to listen, okay? So when you look up there and you say, I can't talk to the Minister of Health, well, do whatever politics you need to, but if it's big enough that you think the Minister of Health needs to know, they'll be ready to listen, 
know, okay? You have to get there. You have to be political to try to find your way to the chair of your department or the dean of your medical school or the president of the hospital or the mayor of your town. But if it's at the level where you need them to hear, go find a way to talk to them. Don't be humble, okay? And then ignore the boss, especially well, I think about being in a, a, a medical student and saying, yes, professor, no professor, and being a resident saying, yes, professor, no professor. It's really hard after eight to 10 years of being subservient to realize ain't nobody who's your boss, okay? When you feel like you're trapped and your hospital's not listening and nobody cares, your little hospital is a stinking little hospital with only 2,000 faculty physicians, okay? The rest of the world is bigger and the people around you at the hospital are bigger and many times people feel trapped by what they think their department or their boss thinks right so talk to your boss get help and when you're just not seeing help just keep rolling because whether you're in or outside the institution the world is preach appreciating what you are doing next slide no, right here. um have a philosophy which is very true <laughs> everybody you work with is smarter than you about something okay I have yet to meet a medical student who didn't give me insight into something that they just knew better than I did. I kept on asking them if they knew the innervation of the brachial plexus and they're saying, no, but I played World Cup soccer for a while and I know that if you really wanna build muscles, right, right? So keep listening to that nurse or PT or other doctor or the, um, the man who's pushing people in wheelchairs in the hospital and ask him, well, how come there aren't any people in wheelchairs on the fourth floor? Well, there's no elevators. Oh, right? Everybody knows something you don't. So they're smarter than you about something. And especially for you uh, foreign volunteers, you know, maybe we've got more MRI scanners in the United States. We do not have more brains. We do not have more leadership skills. And in fact, Americans, because we're this big democracy that's, you know, like this, you don't have the interpersonal political skills that most of our international colleagues have. In smaller countries, there's an excellence in politics that many of my colleagues have that just blows me away because I keep on being a boneheaded American. So you need to look at people who are smarter than you and steal all of their brains. Um, so we're gonna go into breakout sessions now. You've been assigned one of these three groups. Uh, I think test five's on, I'm not sure, but Emmy's here. Um, and your question for the Africa Fellowship is, how do we recruit the best and brightest to participate? I'm excited to get the Caribbean and Latin America group. Hannah and Lauren will moderate. How do we build rehab with Caribbean medical schools? In the South Asia group, Mita and Farouk will moderate. And the question is, how do we catalyze more training programs? This is gonna be very disciplined because it's rapid fire. And I wanna teach you something you may know, which is if you want everybody to participate, don't let Andy Haig do all the talking. You do a round robin brainstorming. So for the first 10 minutes, uh, our mentors are gonna call on each of you. And even if you don't think you have something to say, come up with something, okay? No interruptions. Maybe we go around again and again. And in 10 minutes, I'll send a message that says time to switch. And then people can raise hands with ideas, okay? So if you're ready, I have to be sure that I can actually pull us into this thing and get you into your different groups. Hang on. So first lesson is when you think about Professor Chichi's grippy, okay? We knew this was gonna be hard, right? You only have 20 minutes for a bunch of people who've never met to do something. We had goals. Um, we developed roles of who's leading and who's giving different talks. We had a process, which was you get one minute or whatever, you know, like, like give a quick answer. And yet the interpersonal had to be difficult, right? Some people didn't get to talk. Some people talked too much. Some people didn't get to the point. Some people might've gotten upset about somebody getting to the point. In the real world, you gotta get good at reading these things, okay? We did great, right? I heard all kinds of brilliant ideas come out. Still, you look back at that 20 minute meeting and say, wow, what do we learn and how do we do well together or not? All right, well, we had a lot of awesome ideas. Our question, perfect, okay. Our question was, um, how do we recruit the best and the brightest to participate? And, you know, obviously a huge um, subject was awareness. Um, awareness for not only our, um, 
physicians, but also for our um, other teams around us being aware of how we can participate and how we can give input and that there's training available and that there are global health opportunities available. Um, we talked about mentors and being able to know who previous mentors were and what they did and how they did it. Um, just knowing who someone is was not always helpful enough. And so finding how to find a mentor, who those mentors are, having them advertised, and then knowing what programs they have done, hearing about their programs, but not only hearing about the outcomes for patients, but how they built it, how they learned about the need, how they found the support, how they went to the other teams and built those groups. Um, so kind of the oper 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 I can't say the word, how to operationalize, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, it, an interesting thought that came out was that we need to build awareness in our patient group. Um, I kind of summed it up as direct-to-consumer marketing. You know, we're, we're sitting here trying to find out how to get physicians interested in this, but if enough patients are aware that physiatry exists and is a treatment that they can be receiving, um, they're going to be starting to ask as well. And we know that the market reaches out to what consumers need, which will help build the opportunities um, for training and for treatment. Um, another idea was to do a critical analysis of resources um, in local areas. So this is speaking a little bit more how to get everybody to participate in global health. Um, but by knowing the critical analysis of what's available and maybe building piece by piece on what's already in areas, such as prosthetic groups, which seem to be very widely available across the globe, um, or orthotics groups, or um, uh, other therapies, so that we can start building on what's already there to grow more. And then again, more about um, making people aware was integrating more into training programs and you know, bringing our types of groups and lectures to different training programs, bringing the information to different training programs, all the way from med students up through attendings, right? So we need to get awareness early in the PM&R um, field to all of our medical students, but we also need to bring that through residency, through fellowships, and all the way up to the attendings who may not always be aware, and then reaching out to other global health programs um, who already have established uh, opportunities in different countries so that we can kind of start partnering with them for long-term partnerships and things that are repetitive and available um, so that it can be sustainable. You know, this, um, my own words of kind of medical tourism is, is not something that's going to build PM&R in other places, but having these sustainable groups that maybe we repeat every year was one of the ideas. So we had a lot of great ideas. Unfortunately, we got everybody with one person to speak, so I apologize. Uh, we had a little language barrier there. Um, but those were our thoughts on how to recruit the best and the brightest into PM&R and PM&R Global Health. Anna, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, I have to say the 20 minutes was very fun. We, we did rapid fire in our fast. group. Um, so um, we, had a, we had a really diverse group. We had people from DR, Chile, Venezuela, Miami, New York City, California, Texas, and we had physicians, attendings, residents, and a physical therapist in our group. Um, so it was really interesting to hear everybody's perspective. Um, themes that came up for us um, for the Caribbean group was um, that, again, this sort of lack of exposure and training to PM&R was a real barrier to, to spreading the word of physiatry. Um, there was one person in our group, um, Cecilia Cordova from Chile, who said that she went to one of the best medical schools in Venezuela and they didn't have PM&R at all. So she came to the US to do a rotation and fell in love with it. And so part of you know, building PM&R in Latin America and in the Caribbean is kind of taking that learning back and how do you build up your program? And I think um, what we discussed was that just doing teaching and I mean teaching is important but just doing the teaching and the theory um, is not really enough it can get a little bit boring when all you're doing is listening to lectures so um, our group felt pretty passionate that you have to have hands-on training and really follow somebody who is passionate about rehab to to get other you know medical students or trainees interested in doing physiatry because if you just do the teaching and the theory people might not be interested in it um 
so we felt like the teaching needed to be promoted, but also um, creating kind of observership programs. Um, another person in our group from DR, Marcos, um, mentioned that um, there was a program that he's hoping is going to be started with a um, physician who can bring in medical students to just follow him for a day to, to kind of get hands-on training. Um, and um, another idea that came up was a walking program in New York. So um, just to get people moving um, and to kind of promote physiatry and rehab through local grassroots movements and spread that to other countries in the Caribbean, specifically Puerto Rico. Um, so, I would say all in all, we thought that teaching and exposure needed to be increased and uh, passion in PMNR and really getting hands-on training. Great, so if you'll mute and we will. Uh, Mita and Devendra, yeah. what, what did you hear? Can you see me? Hello everyone. No. It's a pleasure to reconnect with all diverse group of people, such talented people from all over the world. What I saw uh, very clearly was the enthusiasm and the desire to do something. And we feel very happy that 20 years or 25 years of work that Andy has been has started with so much of insight and vision is now bearing fruit. Uh, when I was, um, when we arrived at the hotel yesterday, they gave me a map uh, of Middlebury and uh, the first thing I noticed on the map was you start your own map. And I noticed, I realized that that's exactly what we are here for, to start our own map. And now I see when talking to you that the map is already beginning to take a very good shape. Um, when I listened to Dr. Theron, Francois Theron from South Africa, I realized that um, he was pointing out something that has been echoed by everyone else. So Dr. Uh, Theron, I have a question. Would you be able to see whether um, your country, your universities, your hospital can send some uh, doctors, experienced doctors or resident doctors to America or any other country that is willing to allow them to participate and come as visitors for a time, three months, six months or whatever, and get exposure? which is the bad, most needed thing um, that is commonly felt here. Same thing I would say to our friend in Nepal, who was asking who has the uh, success in getting an American trained physiatrist to spend time in Nepal. That was very admirable. And I think we can follow up on that and build on it. Uh, that's the single biggest thing I felt. And uh, in response to the walk-in, clinic, we should also strive here in our respective universities and hospitals to allow people voluntarily on individual basis, if anybody is interested in learning from any country, to come and, and rotate in, in with us, uh, round with us and learn. And we learn from them in return because we are international rehab. Thanks. Well, the next group is about one of our successes that is growing and many of you may be a part of. So um, Hannah and Emmy, I will mute myself and turn it over to you if you're ready. So um, my name is Mary Elizabeth. I am a nurse practitioner in physical medicine and rehabilitation at the Medical College of Wisconsin. I'm a faculty member there. Everybody's referring to me as Emmy because it's much easier. Um, and I'm been 20 years of experience in PM&R, and I love PM&R because it is truly the marriage of what my undergrad training was in nursing and medicine in order to look at outcomes of patients and function, comfort, and quality of life. Um, and so it's great to be with this group. Uh, and I'm Hannah Steer. I'm a PM&R physician in Boston. I work at Spalding Rehab uh, hospital and also at the VA Medical Center. And I um, actually had very little exposure to PM&R in medical school, even though I was at the University of Pittsburgh, which has a great PM&R program. Um, but even in that school, we really didn't have a lot of exposure. So I kind of fell into PM&R through a friend um, and fell in love with it and with trying to help people with functioning and quality of life. Um, and I have 
uh, I started my global health experience through infectious diseases because that's what I thought I wanted to do. Um, and I did um, some rotations abroad that I think fell a bit more into the medical tourism side of things. So I was really excited when um, I met Andy Haig, who was running the Africa fellowship program to train physicians in Africa to become rehab, fellow, uh, rehab physicians, because I felt like that was more in line with um, my mission and, and what I thought would be you know, more sustainable versus doing medical um, tourism or medical mission. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, IRF Africa Fellowship here. Great. Okay, the next yep. slide. Thank you. All right. So we've been talking about awareness and how to get things started. And with regards to the Africa Fellowship, so for those of you that don't know, um, a number of people on today are current or past fellows of the African Fellowship. And um, what this program is, is a program that um, is teaching PM&R to um, trainees in multiple African countries. So where this all started was um, the situation on the ground, right? So the situation on the ground in Africa was that um, there was no PM&R training, there was no professional organizations, there were no specialty board requirements in the continent of Africa for the most part, and particularly across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, there's this wonderful paper out that we're indicating here, if we can press another button, we need to get that yes. loaded up, um, where uh, Dr. Tanner and uh, her colleagues had done a survey of the different African countries and um, kind of showed us the population versus the number of PM&R physicians and training programs available. And so utilizing this information, um, Dr. Haig and the IRF worked with the Ministries of Health and were able to create um, kind of training programs through Ghana and through Ethiopia, through the um, established universities of medicine in those countries and to create the current training program that we have. So when the fellowship began, is it this one? I'm very bad at different computers. Uh, there we go. So where the fellowship began uh, was in 2018. Um, and initially, as I indicated, it was in Ghana and Ethiopia. And these are the universities that the training program partnered with, the College of Physicians and Surgeons through Ghana and St. Paul's Hospital Millennium Medical College, which are well-established colleges. And as um, Benedict mentioned earlier, it's the, these are the primary training colleges for physicians in specialty areas. The first class was, uh, we had four trainees, Abina Tanner, Asari Christian, Sisse, and I'm going to ruin his name if I say it, and testify. And so um, they were able to graduate in 2020. Then our second cohort is enrolled right now. And those fellows are from Ghana, Ethiopia, and Cameroon. And they are on today, which is Benedict, Sena, and Sinforian. And so what these hardworking leaders do, let me go to the next mm -hmm. slide. Go ahead. What these hardworking leaders do is in addition to their families and their regular job and attending the universities through those local universities um, for medical rotations is they have two years of medical rotations through rehab adjacent programs such as orthopedics, neurosurgery, um, et cetera, et cetera. They, um, th those are the rehabilitation adjacent rotations. And then they once weekly have a 60 minute live discussion Sorry, and we're just, just doing some other people. work okay. to make sure that the people can come back in that have gotten kicked off. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. And then they um, also do a once weekly live lecture with all of us uh, due to the pandemic and the current situation that is always virtual. Next button. Um, the, and then the goal is to have them have rotations in the US uh, so that they can see live working rehabilitation teams. Um, I want to throw my favorite line out there and just point out that, you know, rehabilitation is a team sport. And so the goal is not only to teach the basic principles of rehabilitation and the value added service of rehabilitation to the other teams, but also teach how we can all work together in that team approach to care to have outcomes for patients. So that was the original, an original program. Um, and Dr. Haig worked extensively hard since 2018 and long before that to get it established. And then we've been working hard to kind of improve things. So Hannah, you'd like to take over? All right. Um, so again, 
Andy and the team worked so hard at, at getting, you know, the groundwork of this fellowship up and running. Um, and so Emmy and I came in later and, and are kind of just working on, um, you know, editing the program and, and responding to feedback from the fellows to try to um, kind of enhance the, the training program. So um, we have here a figure that uh, one of the IRF members, Miriam, who couldn't join us today created and she did a great job here. She's, she does a lot of really, really amazing graphic design. Um, and this just shows sort of what our mission is and what the purpose is for the fellowship. Um, so again, you know, we're really trying to empower our local physicians and it's not hard when the physicians yeah. who are in the training program are so excellent yeah. and already leaders in their countries. Um, so we're trying to just help facilitate their learning. Um, and as Andy mentioned earlier, one of the ways that you become a leader is through clinical competency. So um, we're really focusing on um, uh, creating an environment that will help, um, you know, enrich <laughs> knowledge. And we've made some changes there over the last year. And part of the reason we've made those changes is, is to make the, pro the fellowship program a little bit more standardized um, and, um, and kind of tighten it up. I think most people here know that PM&R is a pretty new field and it's really broad and it can be a bit loose. And some of that looseness is great because you have real to, to keep learning dynamic, um, but we're trying to sort of tighten it up um, so that the fellowship resembles other fellowship programs in, um, in these countries. So um, one thing that we've done is in addition to the weekly learning um, didactic is we've had people, our faculty um, who are experts in the field come in and do a, a pre-recorded lecture that the fellows watch one week prior to the live discussion that we have every week. And in that way, we have more time to, to, for the fellows to ask questions and to have discussions with these experts. Um, we've had a lot of high level discussions, which are so great. Um, and, and I think that that's been um, a, an improvement in, in the program is just that there's more time to, to discuss. Um, we are also working on creating pre and post quizzes so that fellows um, know their strengths, know their weaknesses. And then we can also take these kind of the standardized testing back to the hospital or to the government and show them the sort of authenticity of the programs and standardization. Um, we are also working on creating um, a site uh, an online learning platform that archives the lectures, um, archives learning resources like articles, videos on how to do exams, injections, um, and and create and have all of that so that the fellows can refer back to it, and that every year the fellows come in will just add to that. Um, and in the fellowship, um, we also have a research um, requirement so that fellows can spread the word of rehab and work on their own project and, and sort of enhance rehab in the, in the country. Um, okay. So again, we have this virtual learning environment with the recorded lectures um, so that we can have a more interactive learning environment when we do have time because time is so limited, um, especially with the time differences. And again, we'll have these archived resources for fellows that we're working on now. Um, and we mentioned that. So um, what are our future goals for the program? You know, as I mentioned, the fellowship, it's always changing, it's dynamic. We're um, talking with fellows to hear about their feedback and what can be improved. Um, so some of our, our goals and sort of changes we have for the future is um, recruiting more faculty, more experts to participate in the lecture series and discussion. So for those of you out there, I know some of you have done lectures, so thank you. But for others who are interested, please feel free to reach out. Um, and, and we have most of our faculty coming from the US. So if there are, are people out there who are abroad who want to participate in these lectures, that would be great. I think that gathering more faculty from abroad who have experience in other countries would be so valuable for this fellowship. Um, we have to recruit new fellows, so we're working on that as well. Um, and 
a big thing is funding for fellows to travel to the US for PMNR rotations and conferences. So I had mentioned earlier that having hands-on training um, is so important. You know, you can learn online, which is great, but having that learning environment where you're watching an expert do what they do and work in teams, um, you can't beat that type of learning. So obviously it's been difficult during COVID, but um, we're hoping that in the next year or so we can have the fellows come abroad and we're working on getting funding for that and for um, conferences. So again, hands-on training locally and abroad. Um, and again, we're building this online platform um, so that fellows can refer back to um, lectures and, and resources online. And we're doing this through a program called Canvas, which is um, similar to Blackboard. It's not up and running yet, but we're hope, hoping that it will, will get there soon. Um, and then, you know, again, we're training the trainers that's the purpose of the program so we want to continue this mentorship between the african fellows who have graduated and the current fellows and future fellows um, and then have them give lectures so that um, we can we can just help facilitate and support um, fellows learning and and expertise in their countries so with that i will end i don't know if we have time for questions so we, maybe I will say. Um, uh, you're on. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. If if we have about two or three minutes for questions, if there are one or two questions to pop up and unmute. Hi there. This is Lorne. Question: Would this the idea that the same curriculum can be used for? Yeah, instance, I don't hear you. Oh, can you hear me? You have to turn on your sound. I think. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry. Technical <laughs> difficulties. Um. <laughs> It's really excited to see like how much work you guys are doing in terms of the edu education and kind of spreading physiatry through Africa. Um, my question would be, would these, is the idea that the same curriculum can be translated into using in South Africa, I mean, South America and the Caribbean and other areas of interest as well? Yeah, so, um, so what we've been working hard on is getting this standardized, getting it recorded and getting it archived. And that whole thought process is then we can as, as new groups, um, as we can establish new programs and legitimize new programs, they can utilize this exact same platform, all the information's there. I think the one challenge we haven't quite gotten to figuring out yet is how with the live lectures, how we work with all the international time zones, but that is exactly the direction that we're headed with this program is we shouldn't have to create, you know, 147 different training programs. We should have one. Andy wants to add something. Yeah, we, we've developed a lot of the mechanism and some of you have been in some of these meetings about sustainability and growth. And in addition to simply having the training program, we're going to really need local leadership in the different countries like the Caribbean, which is a lot of countries, right? So if we're going to do it at a university or a hospital, then there has to be a local mentor, even if they're not a PM&R doctor. The institution needs to commit to having some beds that can be used with rehab and having some structure around the person, uh, you know, needs to commit to the time they need to spend and, and needs to kind of commit to not just having one doctor go through the program, but saying, well, over the next five years, we're gonna to continue to recruit so that every year there's another doctor or two involved. So there's some external structure when we talk about doing it in another country that we're gonna use also that helps to grow things. Um, and, and it's very much our passion to have this at a point where, um, you know, we can do this all over the world uh, because the lectures can be, as long as you can speak some English, we're good. And the rest of it, we need local mentors for each country too, right? Sorry, go ahead ladies. And I just want to say thank, I, I see Miriam now, she's here. So yeah. thanks for the yeah. excellent figure. <laughs> for those of you that don't know, none of this would happen without Miriam. No, she's, <laughs> she's the leader. One um, other question, um, the, uh, you've kind of mentioned English. Are there any, has ha, up to this point, had, have there been any issues in terms of language barrier with the educational material? And in the future, for instance, in other countries like Spanish or French, um, I think that's probably a way long, a further along the line, but have we thought about like how to overcome some of those barriers? I think that's a great question. We haven't had any issues um, because everybody speaks English. I think the issues we have are, are technology. So people fall in and out of the call, um, but we haven't had any people who, who are not English speaking. Um, and yeah, I, I could have, there's so much technology now 
in you know translating whether it's via youtube or um i i don't know other programs that i don't know the names of to translate lectures so i could imagine that you could translate english lectures to another language um we haven't done it yet yet but i'm saying yet because maybe in the future we could i think that um the archived lectures would be one thing but doing live lectures um, would be more challenging because all of our faculty have been predominantly um, English speaking uh, as first language. So great question though. So if you'll mute. Okay. And I will un um, Sorry. It, yep. And, and what we're doing is we're going to have a five minute break where you can continue to ask and answer questions. But if you need to take a break, it's only five minutes. Seriously, um, get on with it. And if, if you two would feel more questions, that'd be fine. Go ahead and I'll, I'll mute. Sorry, it's Francois. Uh, I might have missed it, but the, the fellowship lasts for how long? Is it a two year or three year? Two years. Two, year. two years. And and sort of the, at the end of two years, is there evaluation or how do you how do you evaluate the competencies at the end yeah. of the two years? What's all, what are the requirements of the fellows? Yeah, so there is uh, an examination at the end of the year. Andy, I don't know if okay. you yeah, did the event yes. last year. So um, under me, it was pretty sloppy. I, I got to continue to say that these two doctors have really <laughs> this discipline process. Uh, both the Ghana College of Physicians and the, the uh, Ethiopian authorities require examinations. And under me, there were some written and verbal examinations that were not validated and standardized. So they continue as such. The challenge there is that the practice, like if you look at the American board certification tests, right? They're great, but American medicine is, is not better in many ways. It's worse than other countries. Like we order MRIs on anybody who has an itch on their nose, right? And also there are diseases in different countries that really need more expertise. For instance, we don't see leprosy and uh, Benedict runs a leprosy hospital, right? So, so even though I'm a little dissatisfied with the standardization of our tests, I also am kind of thinking it's okay. You know, we need to stand, we need to improve on them, make them more uh, broad and more tougher and more standardized. But at the same time, when we go country to country, we don't want to use a Western standard. We want to use one that works for everybody. Thanks. Hey, I wanted to add on something <clears throat> on that. Um, I wanted to ask if you have had any problems with the health departments in the different countries that you have your fellows. And um, I'm thinking on um, spreading the fellowship into South America or the Caribbean. Um, if you had thought about um, talking or working together with any rehab societies that already exist in those countries or on those regions? Because mm -hmm. I'll be happy to help <laughs> on those aspects. I yeah. was going to say, if, yeah, I, I think we should totally, oh, did I just get lost? We can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, oh, there I am. Um, so I, I think that we are looking to expand and with, um, a fellowship that we're, you know, we're trying to make more standardized. I think it could definitely translate to other regions. Um, I would, you know, we would love to talk more about that and and get together and try to figure out how to, you know, spread the word and get people involved. Um, I think recruiting the fellows is may maybe one of the harder things in the fellowship. Yeah. So well, and 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 to come back to your question, I see Abina's there. Hey, Abina, we're gonna answer, talk to you in a second. Um, but, but so we, we, when we talk about doing it in another region, which is what our goal is, right, we need to take a look. So uh, Sinforian in Cameroon, we had discussions and with all the politics there, we felt that his fellows would only get a certificate from the International Rehab Forum. It would not be something recognized by the national governing bodies. Too bad, they're so needed, they're gonna make a living just fine, okay? When we go to Ghana, it's different because Abina and colleagues are very legitimate. We got to the point, thanks to Abina, <laughs> that their that their their uh, national of uh, um, uh, national college of uh, family medicine recognizes the specialty now, and so in Ghana there are a couple of other rules we follow, a couple other things we have to do. So if you talk about us coming to a country and doing it, first of all, um, I'm not going to do all the work, right? <laughs> it's going to be somebody who's got a passion for the country doing it, who knows the country or is committed to the country. 
And then it's creating all these areas where the hospital gets invested, somebody in the, in, the, in the country gets invested, and then we decide together whether this is something we work through getting national accreditation, or we simply give them a, a board certification. In, in the United States, most electromyographers are AANEM board certified, and it's not recognized. So a lot to be done there once we have a champion for a country. Abina. And Abina's oh, coming yeah. up, we're trying to grab Abina, her. Abina, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so back to the question about that, sorry, I lost my voice a bit, but back to the question about the, the certification and the exam, as Andy said, there really has to be someone who is passionate on the ground to push it because obviously the work cannot be on the team in the US alone. And in Ghana, for example, after we saw the assistance, everything IRF was involved in developing the curriculum and everything. And then it had to go through the whole process of it being accepted by the Ghana College of Physicians and Surgeons. And so there was a logbook and there is a curriculum with the logbook to fill and the requirements as well with writing a research paper dissertation. And then there was actually a three-hour exam at the end, and there were external um, PMNR um, physicians who were invited. Actually, during that time, it was COVID, so it was virtual, but it was a thorough exam based on your research, based on your logbook and everything. So you come out and it's you are really recognized as a PMNR physician. And just to end off, I would say that it's really, I've, it's really made a big impact in my life in going through this training. Without the IRF, I don't think I would have been a PMNR physician because in our part of the world, people don't really understand what PMNR is and what we can actually do and the impact actually economically, fiscally, every aspect of the, because disability is seen as um, something that, doesn't need any um, help or any assistance or can't be managed, let me put it that way. And in going through this program, a lot of awareness has been created. Now people see it as authentic. People see the program as, okay, there's something good that comes out of it. And I'm glad that Benedict is, has, is on board. There are actually three more people waiting to join the fellowship next year. They've passed the entrance. So there is an entrance interview with the Ghana College where they assess and admit you. And then the IRF takes over and then they, their training also goes on. So it, it really is cut, um, catching a lot of cloud and, and it's really impacting your life. And honestly, I would say that it has been great for me. Thank you. Um, I don't feel mute. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, a correction for Abina, she was born a rehab doctor and if we didn't exist, she would still be in charge of the whole country, <laughs> just, just to make a clarification. <laughs> uh, we get to take credit for, for brilliance, which is kind of fun. Um, so the, the next part, I'm going to turn it over to Tom. We got ahead of you because of Tom, because so many of you are talking about the lack of people understanding us and Tom's expertise is making people understand things. So Tom, can I turn it over to you then? You may. I will mute. All right, and hopefully we can get through this uh, without too much racket in the background. Uh, share sound and boom, all right. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm Tom. Uh, I actually started the IRF with with these four people behind me, with Mita and Andy and Devendra. And uh, about a couple years into the IRF, I decided I wanted to go back to school, get a journalism degree. And uh, I got accepted to Washington State University, went back. And uh, one of the things I wanted to do was document the things that were happening in the IRF. In fact, it was the main thing I wanted to do. And so after I got out, um, we, we had a conference in uh, Puerto Rico, we had a conference in, in uh, Turkey, and I thought it'd be a great idea to start recording these conferences, documenting them. And then Devendra asked me, he's like, how much would it cost to put a, you know, if we went around, we could document all the clinics where all the doctors were from. And I'm like, eh, that's, we're getting ahead of ourselves. And he's like, no, 
let's let's plan it out. So we went down and how much this would all cost. And we came up with some budget that it was going to be about you know seventy thousand dollars or something. And I was, so we started looking for money for that, and it was uh, not really happening. And then I was like, but on the other hand, I can take a camera out and go film anywhere. And so with that attitude, um, I started filming. And over the last ten years, I've kind of lived a peripatetic life. Uh, going around to clinics, hospitals, schools, started my own program. And so we're going to show you a short five minute film about uh, that I'm calling IRF Films. That's a compilation of the last 10 years of uh, filming. No echoes. IRF Films was conceived in 2011 after communications director Tom Haig graduated in broadcast journalism from Washington State University's Edward R. Murrow College of Communications. The idea was to document many of the clinics, hospitals, and schools where IRF doctors are practicing. The original trial run was at the IRF Bangladesh PMNR Society Conference in Dhaka, 2012. Equipped with just two cameras, the IRF board members shot video throughout the conference and took to the streets of Dhaka for some excellent B-roll or back-roll shots. Unfortunately, a riot broke out in the middle of the conference and all street traffic was banned. But IRF Films was there to cover it. Check out this surreal scene as the board members were driven to their talks via ambulance and police escort. Um, Sierra, could you could you tell us where we're going? We're going across the street. Across the street. So we we called the ambulance to go across the street. Thank you. Just wanted to verify. The following year saw IRF Films go on a global tour, shooting films in five countries. It started with a short documentary on handicap athletics in the French Alps. Then, at the invitation of Germano Pestelli the president of the Italian Society of Pimenar, Tom traveled to the Madonina del Grappa mission in Skoder, Albania. The result of the three-week stay was a 25-minute documentary on the challenging lives of Albania's disability community. From there, Tom was on to Accra, Ghana, where Dr. Gifty Gianti invited Tom to spend a full month in the country shooting schools, clinics, disability groups, and even a major soccer match. The resulting film, IRF Goes to Ghana, won first prize in the Consortium of Universities for Global Health video competition. In 2015, in the wake of the massive Nepalese earthquakes, Dr. Raju Dakal invited Tom to spend time as a peer counselor at Kathmandu's Spinal Injury Rehabilitation Center. The 50-bed facility suddenly had more than 100 new spinal cord cases. Tom arrived in Kathmandu with two new cameras, a new microphone, and a robust computer for editing. It all fit into one very heavy bag, which patients and staff referred to as the brick. This time, he embedded himself for six months in country with a team of therapists, patients, family members, and nearly the entire Kathmandu disability community. They created more than 30 films on physical therapy, occupational therapy, nursing, and disability awareness. To date, those films, mostly in Nepalese, have been viewed more than 100,000 times. The takeaway from the project was not the finished products, but the way they were produced. As it turns out, video production is the most effective vocational program we have seen in a disability setting. The next move for IRF Films was to find a disability center that would accept the new vocational program. Tom got in contact with the Centre Talibu Dabo, Dakar, Senegal's top disability school. The program was presented to their headmaster, who heartily agreed to use his school for a beta test. In December of 2019, after spending two years raising funds for the trip, Tom arrived in Dakar with two computers, nine cameras, three microphones, and all the requisite tripods, wires, and computer chips to teach the class. When Tom got to Dakar, he was introduced to an adult educational program at SHOM, the Centre Hôpitalé de l'Ordre de Malte, West Africa's leading center for leprosy rehabilitation. 
Tom spent mornings at the Centre Talibou Dabo and afternoons doing serious video production work at Shome. Things at the Centre Talibou were difficult as most of the children had very severe disabilities, making even turning on a camera difficult. But after three months, the class had come together as a team and was able to produce several videos with two and even three camera shoots. But the program at Shome turned out to be historic. Over the course of three months, the team produced 13 videos highlighting the activities of each department at the hospital. Everything from the shoemakers and the kitchen staff to the head surgeon and the hospital director. It's the most in-depth documentation of leprosy rehabilitation ever recorded. Although COVID has curtailed the exploits of IRF films, we hope to be back out there documenting rehabilitation subjects and making patients feel all the energy that video production can bring. <laughs> There, so that's uh, that's been my project. One of the things about this project is it it's a an example of how you can use the IRF. We did all the funding using the the 501c3 uh, capacity of of uh, the IRF. So I could go around doing public speaking. We did concerts, uh, just going around asking for donations. Um, we have with us today a special guest um, and. It's a really great story. With each one of these shoots I've gone on, I always glom onto one, if not several people, but one person spe specifically who will help me uh, be a production assistant, uh, set up new shots. And in uh, Senegal, in Dakar, I came across this great, great guy, and he's, he's Abdul Nado. And Abdul, you can mute, you can mute, if you want. Oh, you mute. T'es muté. Abdou, tu, on ne t'entend pas. On ne t'entend pas. Ah, well, let, we'll see if he's... I, I did. I just did. Um, so, Abdou, on ne t'entend pas. Tu vois, voilà. Allô. C'est bon. Uh, I would like okay. to present Abdou Nado to everybody. And yes, Abdou... Um, Okay, I'm Abdul Ndaw. My name is Abdul Ndaw. I live in Senegal. I was a patient in Shum, uh, Santa Australia or the Malt in Dakar. Okay, I'm a journalist. So Abdul, having no formal training in journalism, became our primary journalist. And it was just fantastic. It, it's what the whole program was about, to get, uh, to show like a vocation to people that never thought it was possible. Possible. And uh, so Abdu became the presenter whenever we do these uh, talk, whenever we do these films, we'd be interviewing doctors, uh, kitchen staff, uh, shoemakers, things like that. And we'd all come up with a script and Abdu would be the one who would read the questions. And then in three in the most the more important interviews with the surgeons, with the director, they would do a one on one, uh, just like on 60 Minutes, something like that. And uh, he was just absolutely fabulous. And it was, it was, you know, it was a diamond in the rough. And Abdu had never done anything like this before. And uh, I urge you, it, the, the films are mostly in French, but some, of, some are translated in English. Um, it's just fantastic to see the work that he did. Having absolutely no training, he was as good as anybody. So, uh, Abdu, qu'est-ce que tu te rappelles du, du, du programme là? Uh, le programme de Chaume? Oui. Voilà. Le programme de Chaume, c'était vraiment un très beau programme. It's a great program. Euh, là, là où on a interviewé euh, à chaque département maintenant du, de l'hôpital hors de Malte. We interviewed each department at the, at the show, at the hospital. OK, le directeur et maintenant les médecins, les infirmiers étaient très, très fiers de cette, de cette interview et de ce reportage. So the, the, the directors, the, the surgeons, the nurses are extremely proud of, this, of, the, of the result of this program. C'est-à-dire le plus grand, la plus grande joie, c'est que euh, les, le médecin chef était d'accord parce que était content parce que nous avons fait euh, le reportage gratuitement sans demander aucun, aucun sou, aucun, rien d'argent. Donc voilà ce qui lui a fait euh, so, fier. The, the happiest thing of this, the director was just the, the director was thrilled with this. 
um, because the program was great and it didn't cost us any money. <laughs> it didn't cost them any money. So they, they'd had a, a, a team in there before that cost some money and it, uh, the, they shot like, you know, three minute video and we have over an hour's worth of stuff. So um, I would like to personally thank Abdou. Merci Abdou. Et, et aussi, euh, ça, ça a permis aussi de, de promouvoir l'hôpital parce que l'hôpital n'était pas tellement connu, mais avec ce euh, reportage, euh, il, a, il a poussé l'hôpital à être plus connu sous la, dans le pays surtout et dans la sous-région. So he said they, they've used these videos for, to promote the hospital because the hospital was not well known. And uh, now using these videos, they can send them out all over and uh, the hospital is becoming very well known. It's, it's the best leprosy center in all of West Africa. So now it's getting its due, pardon me, because of, the, because of this program. Okay, um, parce que concernant maintenant la léprologie, euh, c'est-à-dire euh, la chirurgie euh, orthopédique, c'est l'hôpital numéro un en Afrique de l'Ouest, numéro un, number one. So he's very proud that this is the number one leprosy hospital, especially for surgery in, in all of West Africa. Um, so thank you. Merci, Abdou. Uh, it, it was just great working with him. It was just such a, just when you see people that are doing vocational programs that bore the crap out of them and you show them this uh, video thing, they're like, huh, we can do that too. And it works. It works. It was really just, just a fantastic, uh, fantastic program or fantastic uh, result of, of the program. Um, any, any questions? Any uh, responses? I'd like to say hi to Abdul. Uh, I speak French as well, and I've actually been to Senegal in the past. Bonjour, Abdou, mon nom c'est Lorne Louisin. J'ai visité ah, le Senegal en fait en 2000, euh, en 2011 euh, au Dakar, et puis j'ai travaillé avec Rapta, le réseau, le réseau africain pour le, la promouvoir de, pour la nutrition, quoi. Alors, euh, enchanté et puis bon travail. Ok, enchanté moi aussi, je suis content de vous rencontrer, merci beaucoup. Ouais. Et quelles questions vous voulez-vous poser? <laughs> Ma question, ça serait, or should I ask a question in English or in French? Sorry. You can do both. You can okay. um, Ma question serait pour, uh, du, du, du côté médical, est-ce qu'il y a des, des docteurs qui sont... Um, à part de l'orthopédie, qu'ils ont de l'expérience avec le domaine de réhabilitation au Sénégal ou bien à Dakar, à Dakar spécifiquement. Ma question est juste spécifiquement, if he, are there any like rehab physicians that are in uh, Sénégal or in Dakar specifically? Ok, vous savez, euh, le, dans le domaine de la ré, réhabilitation ou bien la kinésithérapie, il y a milliards de problèmes au Sénégal, milliards de problèmes. There's tons Pourquoi? of problems. Pourquoi? Parce que déjà, il n'y a pas euh, la demande est mille fois supérieure à la demande, la de, à la à l'offre, mille fois supérieure à l'offre. C'est-à-dire, il faut the des supply is ten thousand de... times bigger than the demand. Ok, il y a il y a centaines de demandes et il y a que dix seulement, euh, par exemple, qui, qui qui font la kinésithérapie au Sénégal. Et, et le princi la principale cause maintenant de la, de, 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 par exemple so the principal, aussi... the biggest problem for uh, rehabilitation doctors, well, there aren't any, but um, the biggest problem that puts people in the hospital are car accidents, which is the same in Ghana as well. Et surtout, et surtout aussi, uh, uh, la tension artérielle. C'est énorme au Sénégal. Et même pas le ministère, le ministère de la, de la Santé n'a pas un programme spécial pour, pour maintenant ces, ces chaisons-là qui sont atteints de, 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 de... The problem in Senegal is the, the minister of, of health does not have any program to, to, to attack this. And it's a, it's a constant program that they're fighting in hospitals all over Senegal. Bon, il n'a même pas, il n'y a même pas un centre maintenant qui hospitalise des, 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 des patients... Euh, voilà, atteints qui, qui ont besoin maintenant de la kinésithérapie ou bien la, la rééducation. Il n'y a, a pas au Sénégal. Un concentre au Sénégal. Les gens vont le matin euh, et re, repartent le soir. So there, there's obviously this huge need for it and there just isn't any supply of doctors who do this. So uh, hopefully, we, you know, we, IRF can do 
you know, a French adaptation of fellowship in the, in the future. We'll see. Thank you, Abdu. And we have to. Good. So first of all, apologies. Somebody invaded Hannah's group and was using some pretty bad language and it took us a while to kick them out. Um, doesn't belong in our world. I, I apologize for that. Yeah, it's just completely crazy. Um, so um, groups, what I'd like to do again is to have somebody who's <clears throat> a lead in each group to maybe make a quick little list of ideas, maybe almost almost without comment, a minute or two, of what came out in your group. Um, uh, Tom, would you be able to do that first? Sure. Um, you can unmute. Okay, we're lucky we get to go first because I'm guessing a lot of the ideas were Will be will be quite similar. Um, so very quickly going down the thing, um, we talked about getting med med student PMNR groups together and get them active on social media. Um, we talked about multimedia filmmaking, um, grassroots, uh, doing beyond just physicians, trying to get deeper into uh, the patient physical therapy community, thing like that. Very important to have an elevator speech five bullet points, what is physiatry? If someone comes up and asks you, say, boom, it is boom, 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 run it down. Um, talked about uh, that this form of medicine does have advanced skills and these are really cool things to learn. So it's actually, a, you know, people are afraid that it's not a very advanced form of medicine and they should do something more serious. And that's not the case. There are very serious aspects of physiatry and let, let people know that. Um, Get in practice, tie in with private practice, uh, some outreach with those doctors. Um, and then hopefully, if you can, get involved yourself with, with policymakers in government. And the last thing was uh, include adaptive sports in your uh, promotional materials. Great. Um, Hannah, if everybody mute. And Hannah, come on up. All right. Um, so I'm just gathering my thoughts here. Um, so one thing that we heard um, from the US side was, so how to kind of um, expand global health, PM&R global health from, I guess, the Western um, side of things is to um, talk with groups, with medical specialties that are already established um, globally, like infectious diseases, you know, internal medicine, um, and, and kind of, you know, establish a group through them and, um, and, try to kind of share some strategies there and, and share with ID and I am how PM&R can help um, and get them more interested. Um, another idea was having workshops and conferences on topics related to PM&R, perhaps bringing in, again, other specialties, surgeons, pediatricians, neurologists, uh, to learn more about rehab. Um, and maybe they need to learn more about rehab as well because they, there is a lack of PM&R physicians. Um, Another thing we talked about was utilizing social media, so Twitter, um, getting the word out about rehab, um, and also um, leaning towards you know, trainees and medical students and exposing them um, at an earlier stage of training so that they know the idea, what, what PM&R even is. Um, let's see, was there another? Um, also, from our physical therapist, Venetia's standpoint, having students come shadow PT and come shadow therapy so that they get a better idea of, of what happens, you know, after a medical illness or condition. Um, okay. Oh, and also one of our other points was talking about climate change and rehab. I think that's a really hot topic. So, and I think that people would be really engaged and interested. And one more thing is of also talking with our specialists that really care about outcomes like cancer rehab, cardiac rehab, and, and showing them how rehab does improve long-term outcomes. Um, and that's all from our side. Great. Uh, Thanks. Em, can you do it? Sure, you make us go towards the end when all the ideas are out there already. <laughs> Um, right, so in addition to all those ideas, which you guys have picked most of them already, um, we talked a little bit about um, community outreach programs. One of our members has, uh, she's already messaged everybody in the group, an exercise and walking program with patients, right? And that's a great opportunity to partner with the community, make them aware of PM&R, be visual to community as a whole, um, and to, to meet patients and let them know what it is our specialty is. Um, we talked about increasing opportunities for global health rehab electives 
um, and making people, um, current residents aware of electives and rotations um, so that they can kind of have more opportunities. And spreading our ideas to local PMNR groups regarding global health, so a little bit more of a tilt towards you know, global health PMNR and not just PMNR in general, um, and trying to really structure those partnerships a little more formally. Um, and I don't think there's anything else. I'm running through the list you guys had because we had so many things. I think those were the ones that you guys didn't bring up that we had to, to mention. Um, great. And, and, and last, I, I really need to make introductions because my friend Miriam, who is our executive director, uh, ran off suddenly to Korea and somehow, despite all those <laughs> flights, joined up with us. And so, Miriam, uh, would you please reflect what your group thought, but also if, if, if we were new, knew you were crazy enough to join us despite all that, I really would love to get your thoughts on where we're going and, and what else needs to be said today. So, Miriam, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm really happy to make it on time. <laughs> Um, it's like past, it's close to 1 a.m. right now, but I'm bright awake, <laughs> you know, having these great discussions. So our group had a very interesting mixture of trainees from U.S.-based uh, institutions as well as um, international um, physicians. Um, and we talked about, you know, how we need to target different levels of audiences. So we talked about three levels. One is the, you know, level of uh, peers, so the doctors uh, or medical students. And then the other uh, level was the amongst the general public and the patients. And then the third level of target audience was the policymakers. Um, and we talked about, you know, how do we engage all three at the same time? And, you know, universal uh, communicate like strategic communication method we talked about is getting the data and the, getting the publications out there because having the publication really has a, uh, a weight on to, on the on the uh, communication that we would be doing either to the policymakers as well as the you know the, the communities and some interesting ideas that we uh, talked about is you know having uh, ways or having ways to really change the culture of people. You know, some countries have this culture of not knowing, not only just not knowing the PNMR, so it's, it would mean like educating them, but really changing the culture of people so that they know that PNMR is available and what PNMR is. And so instead of going to, um, you know, uh, one person said quacks. So there are like non-physicians who are like healing people. Instead of that, we, we you know, change this culture to, you know, educate them to go to go see a um, PNMR physicians or, or other physicians. And other um, things we talked about is um, having some stories made. So stories from patients and family about the impact of PNMR in their lives. So some countries see disability as something that cannot change anything. So it, some people see disability as like a helpless sort of nothing can be done type of thing. And having PNMR intervene and, and hearing their stories of positive feedback from them, would uh, we think that would uh, communicate well to the general public as well as the policymakers. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> hearing thoughts because those are the ones that count here. <laughs> well, I, I, this was, another like reassuring moment for for IRF to realize what our role is and, and how important our mission is, which is to gather people to build PNMR globally, right? So, you know, this uh, meeting was one of the platform for us to all gather and hear everyone's thoughts. And, you know, not only sharing our thoughts, but getting projects made from these uh, incredible ideas that you guys have. So we are you know, IRF is working hard um, in the back end um, as we are revamping our organization. We are trying to create new websites um, in October so that we can communicate well to you guys, not only to you guys, but also to the public about what programs that we have, what opportunities that you guys can join. So, you know, we hear how there's lack of um, you know, lack of, op, you know, ways to see what opportunities are out there. So that's definitely something that IRF is working on right now. Um, so hopefully, you know, uh, you'll be able to see all those changes by, by this fall. Um, but really, this meeting really reassured us how, how important uh, 
you know, the work that we're doing and, and um, you know, all the support that you guys are giving us. So looking forward to seeing more projects coming from your ideas. And, and after this meeting, I'm gonna be sending out a survey as well as a way for you guys to sign up. Um, you know, so I'll create a list of things that, you know, after today's meeting, I'm gonna create a list of ideas that perhaps we can create a, you know, separate working groups in the future so that we can really make things um, to a real like hands-on action items. So thank you guys. Great, uh, and thanks for joining us after crazy times, Miriam. Um, let me share my screen, uh, that one. Um, you're seeing it, no, you're not yet. I, I can get this. We're like, sure, that's, that's not the screen we need. We need this screen. Come on. There we go. Hey, um, it was Saturday and you all showed up. And that's pretty cool. Let's take a deep breath. Um, this would have been better as a two-day meeting where we all sit down over coffee and wake up in the, break in the morning blurry-eyed after having a nice night out on the town and are really bonding as a group. Um, you did a good job of that anyhow. I, I think at least I got a sense more of those of you that I haven't met before of some personality and mission and passion. And of my old friends, um, I got pretty excited to see you out there doing brilliant things. So, so you know, this is pretty neat. But let's put this together here. You know, first, some thanks. So this is Porter Medical Center from the University of Vermont system. And they volunteered this space and all the technology. So I really want to thank them. Um, the gang around me, um, holy cow, um, you guys have done some wonderful things over the years. And it continues to be bright. And yeah. they're happening well. So thank you all. Um, so I need to mute, please. Um, you are the first group of young PMNR doctors who are working professionally and seriously on the issue of global academic rehab. There's a 70 year history of Howard Rusk and others building this program in different countries, but, but the science and the teaching of how we do this is new. And you're looking at the leaders of this academic specialty of global rehab whether you come from a low resource country, uh, Europe, Asia, uh, the United States, you're, you're it. So look around, because if you're really doing this, you're gonna show up at meetings together and be presenting and collaborating, okay? We're gonna run, write some kind of a paper about this, maybe a couple of papers, because uh, we need to try to raise a flag. We need some publicity or, or marketing <laughs> to make sure people know that you're out there. So for those of you who joined late or who joined on the fly, be sure to send us your email address and who you are and where you're from and uh, we'll make sure you're acknowledged as, as part of that process. Um, we have lots to do. Um, over the last year, <clears throat> the IRF has had the Africa, the um, uh, Caribbean, uh, and the rest of the world committees, these three committees. And the South Asia committee is not, was not happening because the South Asians are in South Asia, right? <laughs> Except for my friends, Mita and Devendra and a few others. And, and I think that, that we need to keep move, these moving forward. If you're not into a, one of those groups, um, join up because we'll try to have those groups be working groups for those regions, okay? You leave here today and you might just take a nap or you might go, you know, I gotta lead this. Uh, I gotta lead this, which means you're gonna wanna get a local group of friends. Don't rely on us, we're too far away. Get that group that gets together once a month for pizza, the students, the old people, the the banker who used to be interested because their kid has you know, cerebral palsy or something like that. Remember that when you meet with a group of leaders in any area of anything, and there's 10 of them in the room, a third of them are crying. A third of them have a child or a mother or a sister who suffered for lack of rehab. They may not make eye contact, but you can confidently sit there with the minister of health and say, you know what I'm talking about. And they will, because it's our people, right? Um, Keep us updated. The, the more you let the IRF know what you're doing, just, just FYI, it, it makes us all look powerful. The more you get on that Facebook page and say, hey, guess what? We held a little meeting or hey, guess what? I um, really am worried about this. Uh, just be very actively involved with us so that all of us can see that we're all a group together. Um, uh, where this organization can be used um, let us know, come up with plans, we'll do what we can. Uh, we won't commit fraud and we won't use our name lightly, but anything short of that, if we can help you, you know, let us know, right? And then 
of course, we have to get together again. I'm, I'm thinking online was wonderful because so many of us can't travel. And that's probably true after COVID. But at the same time, we're planning on trying to find a way to get meetings, for instance, right before the ISPRM meeting, uh, et cetera, where we can all uh, shake hands uh, and then wash them again and wear masks and then take them off and give each other a hug. Um, so you guys are awesome. Great work, everyone. I hope at least a little bit of your voice was heard because you're the personalities that are doing the job. And everybody have a great rest of the weekend. Nice work. Thank you so much.